Okay, this is our um, third session of the uh, Sail to the Sun South. And the reason I think, as I, I mentioned previously, is that the boat shows didn't bother giving any seminars on how people should be able to get south. I figured that, you know, if I wanted, if people want to find a comfortable way to get south, maybe I should be doing it. That's the whole purpose of this. Anyway, what I'm going to do, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about, um, about certain destinations <coughs> from down to um, Myrtle Beach. We'll be talking about the inlets and anchorages and such. Um, I'll be giving some fairly specific information. And if you have any questions, you know, just, just jump in with them. So let me go back to screen sharing here again. Um, it's okay, bear with me. And yeah. there it is. Okay, can everybody see the screen now? Yes. Yep. I almost think I knew what I was doing. Okay, you're the class of 2022. Congratulations, people. Um, okay, and uh, people coming in here, bear with me. Okay, um, I want to just re rehash with everybody because not everybody gets it uh, all, all the time right off the bat. Um, you have to remember that as you're sailing south, stuff is, is going to go wrong. It, it can't help but go wrong uh, because you're on a boat. Um, things are going to break. Anchors are going to occasionally drag and storms are going to happen. Uh, schedules definitely don't work and your outboard is going to screw up. Um, maintenance is mandatory. And talking about maintenance, let me remind everybody, if you have lead acid batteries, make sure that you check your water on the batteries more regularly. And the reason for that is that you're using your boat a lot more than you were before you started cruising. Um, and what you don't want to do is drain the water out of the batteries and destroy your batteries. I've seen that happen to people and, you know, it costs them hundreds of dollars to replace a lead acid battery set. Um, going on, that's the sort of thing that's going to discourage you. And there are times when you're going to feel discouraged and it, it certainly happened to me. Um, it's just one of those things you learn to live with and you embrace it. Okay. The whole point of cruising, and, and this is directed to the, the men here, it's supposed to be fun. You've got to take the time to enjoy your trip and to enjoy your partner. Uh, and then, of course, there's guys like Greg and I who are single and don't have partners, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, but try and make a point of scheduling a marina day every week to 10 days. <clears throat> you want to, you know, you want to relax and do laundry. You'll have boat chores. You want to avoid any bad weather that's coming up. So, you know, get off the boat and take a break. Do some exploring. Uh, go walk on the beach. You know, whatever, whatever looks like fun. There's lots of great museums and uh, and historic sites along the East Coast ICW to, to visit. Um, what I used to say was have a plan and not a schedule. And what somebody said to me once after that was, you know, don't worry about a schedule, just have intentions. Now that, that made a lot of sense, you know, like I intend to do something, but if it doesn't work out that way, I'll do it later, I'll get to it later. And it's a lot more relaxing when you cruise that way with no schedule in mind. Okay, now some of the things that you definitely need to remember just to reinforce that again for you, um, stop hurrying, take your time. You're not in a schedule. It's not like you're working for somebody. It's not like you have to be any place. Um, if you think that you're going too slowly, you want to go back to rule number one and reread it. Oh, and if it starts snowing where you are, get moving, get moving because you are traveling too slowly at that point. Otherwise, go back to rule number one and remind yourself about taking your time. Okay. Now, last week... For those who missed it, we talked about bridge timing. And as you go through, especially North Carolina, there's a couple of bridges that will really slow you down if you miss them. Uh, and as you get down to uh, south of uh, Fort Pierce, you're going to run into, or Palm Beach, I should say, there's a bunch of bridges that you're going to run into um, that are going to slow you down. If, and you don't want to be caught at a bridge going round and round in circles, especially if there's a bunch of other boats there, because you, you just increase the chances of, of having an accident, bumping another boat, you know, being uncomfortable. If you have a chart plotter that will do this, and Garmin is one that will do it, set a go-to point at your next bridge, okay? Your next bridge is five, six, eight miles, whatever way it is. Set a go-to point at the bridge and then click for that go-to. And what'll happen is that your, your chart plotter will come up with a, an estimated time of arrival. What you wanna do is drive your boat at a speed that will get you there about five to 10 minutes in advance of that opening. Now. If your boat will not go that fast, let's say that you're you're you want to make a, a one o'clock opening, <clears throat> and to do that you'd have to do eight knots, and you know you can't do eight knots. 
then you're going to have to look at a 130 opening, for example. I do some examples down below. But the idea is you want to set a time that you that you can do a comfortable speed for to make the bridge opening about five to ten minutes before the opening. And then you have a minimal amount of weight. This will also give you a chance to account for currents. <clears throat> now, if your chart plotter doesn't have a go-to feature with timing, what you can do is, is the following. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my flummy today. Note the statute miles where you are on your chart plotter and also at the bridge and subtract that to get the total distance you have to cover. So for example, um, let's say that you have 10 miles to go to the next bridge, divide that total dis distance in statute miles by the time you have to get to that bridge. So if you have an hour and a half to get to the bridge, 10 divided by 1.5 hours is 6.67, <clears throat> okay? Now, if your boat won't do 6.67 knots, then obviously you're not gonna make it in an hour and a half. You're gonna have to do it in two hours. So in other words, your speed at that point would be five statute miles and, and very few boats will not comfortably do five statute miles an hour, um, uh, even against a current. So basically that's what you're doing there. You're trying to balance your speed against your arrival time to minimize the wait time at the bridge, okay? Now, if you travel, if you, hang on a second, where are we here? If you travel the speed you're doing in knots, as opposed to statute miles, you're going to gain a 15% cushion in time. And where that matters is in some place like North Carolina, where you're getting a lot of currents, the current will be ahead of you for a while, then it'll be behind you. And you'll be speeding up from four and a half knots to six and a half knots. And it, it, gets, it gets confusing and it gets frustrating. So if you're, if, you're running in, if you're running your speed in knots, but doing your calculations in statute miles, what'll happen is you gain a 15% cushion there. Now, you can also do this work the night before by using the route function on your chart plotter. Um, I, I, I'm not a big fan of using route functions on the ICW because it, and I've seen people who've done it and they, they put in every twist and every turn and it takes them a long time, but some people are happy doing that and feel more comfortable. It's up to you if you do it that way or not. Um, I don't, but then um, that, that level of detail has never been to me has never been super crucial on the chart plotter. Pat, as I remember right, you did that on the ICW, didn't you? Pat Banyas? Yeah, no, I did not. Okay, it wasn't you. I forget who it was, but there was one person who, they, they had every single turn in the ICW. It was just, it was painful to watch. <laughs> okay. Um, I think everybody here has probably passed Beaufort, North Carolina now, but Beaufort to Swansboro, what you're watching out for are the trouble spots. Um, and there's not a lot of them, but at statute mile um, 208.8, and that's 0.3 nautical miles past R6, you're gonna find some shoaling for approximately 500 feet. At that location, you wanna to stay to the center, center right of the channel, okay? Now you're saying, well, how can I tell how wide the channel is or, or what the width of the channel is? Take a look behind you and see where the last marker is Look ahead and see where the next marker is, and that'll give you a sense of whether you're in the center of the channel or not. Now, when you're coming down towards this particular um, swelling area, just before you get to G7, green seven, bear slightly to the right. And then from G11 to R12, which is a distance of 0.6 nautical miles, that's the next swelling area that's, that's shown in the little chartlet here. Uh, you want to stay center, okay? Just take a look at the red, take a look at the green, and aim yourself right down the center, and you should be fine with that one. Okay. Now, Swansboro, and I, I really like Swansboro. Um, Greg, Pat, I think you guys probably have some pretty good memories of it too. Uh, for dockage there, you've got Caspers and you've got the city dock, plus you have a dinghy dock if you choose to anchor out. <clears throat> it's an excellent anchorage in my opinion. Not everybody likes it. I find it a good one. It's got good holding, even though there's a strong current there. And there's one shoal spot, which you want to watch for, which is almost directly opposite the city dock, maybe a little bit to the uh, east of it. Uh, there's a very strong current at the city dock. So when, if you choose to dock at the city dock, be very cautious and go in bow first, okay? You want to have, your, you want to have the use of your engines to be able to safely get in. Try and plan your exit to leave at slack tide, because again, because of the current. Backing out with a current behind you, especially because they have no assistance at the town dock, can be very challenging. 
Uh, there is a face dock there, but uh, this time of the year, um, they ask that the face dock be reserved for boats, I think 45 or 50 feet and over. Uh, if it's empty when you get there and it's late in the day, just grab the spot. It'll make your life easier the next morning. Now, when you come in, you're going to be coming down the the um, the ICW, and I, I think you can see my uh, my cursor there. Following that route, there's a marker here R2. Do not cut through here because that's a shoal. Go all the way along until you're almost on a straight line with the channel heading to the bridge, and then make your right turn up here. Okay. And where you're headed for is up here, which is the city dock. Um, if you go onto the waterway guide for comments on the anchorage, um, the, the, there's a lot of negative comments, and, and quite frankly, they, they don't comport with with what I've 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 seen at this at this particular anchorage. And uh, I would I just basically just ignore them. A uh, good spot to stop for a, a brew, a drink is the is right at the end of the city dock. It's called the Bake Bottle and Brew. Uh, it's an excellent pub. Uh, there is shopping about a mile or so down. Um, I think it's a Piggly Wiggly, Pat. Um, Greg, maybe one of you guys can remember. Um, yeah, it is the Piggly Wiggly. Pig I was there today. Oh, <laughs> okay. Good call. Um, anyway, there's a Piggly Wiggly there. And uh, oftentimes there's some hangers, around, hangers on around the dock or around the Bake Bottle and Brew. We'll actually offer to give you a ride. If you don't want to anchor out or, or tie up in Swansboro, then your next anchorage is going to be Mile Hammock, which is the uh, the camp base. Now, from Swansboro to Mile Hammock, there is one problem area, and that's the shoaling at the corner just before Mile Hammock. This wasn't a problem a few years ago until the hurricane came through. Um, I can't remember if it was Dorian or which um, which hurricane, but in any event, it opened up the um, it opened up a passage to the ocean there, and that's created some new shoaling. Now, when you come through here, okay, you want to stay, you want to favor the right at 66A, which is the first one you come to, and then stay a little bit off of 65A, and then aim down and stay fairly close to um, 66B, okay? Now, in case you're wondering where I'm getting these charts from with the... Um, the hydrographic things, these are the Aquamaps charts, okay? And they have the US Army Corps of Engineers hydrographic charts overlaid on them. So you can actually see the depths. So that's, so when you're coming down, like I said, when you come through kind of favor 66A, come all the way down and then bump a little way, a bit away from 65A and then come back down and swing around 66B. Okay, now something to keep in mind, R66B has been moved and that will not be shown on most of the charts. Okay, so and it's probably not shown on your chart, by the way, on your, unless you have absolutely brand new charts uh, available. So that's, um, that's leading um, to Mile Hammock. Now, the next challenging area is just past um, Mile Hammock. This is New River Inlet. And again, this is not difficult. It used to be much worse. They had some real problems there for about two years. Uh, and the um, the car, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had not changed the um, the the uh, the day marks and the and such, so nobody was sure where to go. But what it is now, you come up past marker seventy, stay to the center of the channel, stay straight in the line, follow through seventy two A, come up almost all the way. You can see where that top red arrow is pointing, almost all the way to red twelve A, and then turn and aim down at the point of land. To your left, to your port side, okay? Aim almost straight at it. And then when you're, I'm just trying to visualize this. When you're about 75 feet or so off of it, turn again to the left and come up around and then that'll bring you back over towards, um, uh, I can't remember which marker that is, 76. Um, and that'll bring you back into deep water again. So again, come straight up center until you come to the, to almost to 12A, hang a left and head towards the point of land here. And I know that feels wrong. You want to go straight towards 74, but that's the wrong way. That's going to hey, lead Wally. you. Hello? Hi, this is Bob. We went through there today and, and there's a um, there's a barge right up against the, uh, the shore there. So it was really confusing because we were making that hard left turn 
And then I got really confused, but you've just got to keep that barge on your port side and just keep pressing through. Okay, I think I'm not, I can't recall that barge was there in my way through last year. Um, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. Just so if that, that barge is right at that point of land is what you're saying, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yes. so just, yeah, so in other words, you're aiming straight for the barge and then you swing away from it and, um, okay. and okay. good, excellent. Well, that's what I, that's what I call up to date information. <laughs> okay, now the right full beach anchorage. Um, you when you come in to Wrightsville Beach, something to remember is that the Wrightsville Beach Bridge, just before you come to the, the inlet, the entrance to the inlet, I should say, is only on the hour. Okay, so you want to get your timing so you hit it on the hour, especially if, if as usually happens, you're coming there towards the end of the day. Um, Greg, I think you and I had to deal with that last year, didn't we? I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Somebody was somebody somebody went aground and I was waiting for them and I couldn't remember if it was you or not. Anyway, well, um, that, that often of happens course, Greg. To me. <laughs> That's what I like about Greg, folks. He's honest. Okay. Anyway, you want to try and time it so that you come to the Wrightsville Beach Bridge on the hour because a it's going to be late. You want to get through there no later than five o'clock, and b um, it's usually got a lot of small boats in that area. It's a very busy little area, so you don't want to be skedaddling around the uh the north side of that bridge for very long when you come through <clears throat> excuse me when you come through you're going to hang a left under the channel just swing down there's a bit of shoaling right there but watch for it it's not hard to get it's not it's easy to miss it swing down the marina here is called atlantic sea path okay which is on the channel heading towards the anchorage um good diesel good diesel prices good people um and and very friendly um, they typically, around this time of year, the, none of the places around here will have dockage unless you call well in advance. So swing down, as you come around the corner here around 19 and 20, okay, watch your depths, okay? You don't want to get into, you don't want to get too far to the right, you don't want to get too far to the left because it shoals out in both directions. Swing around, favor the, um, favor the, uh, the, the land side here at the corner. Now keep in mind too, when you come into the channel here, once you leave the ICW, come into the channel, green is on your right for this for this little section of channel. And the reason for that is that this is it's this leading to the inlet. So you come around the corner here, swing out, and then you can either go to the right towards Mott's Channel Inlet. There's a very large anchorage there. It's not hugely well protected, or over to the left towards the bridge which has got better protection, although it's usually a little more crowded. Uh, if you want to go ashore, there's a dinghy dock right in the corner by the bridge. Um, the anchorages are fairly deep, 10, 11, 12 feet. Uh, and the holding is very, very good. The one nuisance there that I happen sometimes, you'll get kids who go flying through in their, their daddy's boat and put up a huge wake. And usually it's just necessary to yell at them once or twice and they stop doing it. Not that I would yell at the kids. Right, Greg? Oh, no. No, you're a sweetheart. Hey, Raleigh, can I make a okay. comment? Right. Absolutely. Um, for those that are running behind, north of Wrightsville Beach, Harbor Village Marina is a private marina right off the waterway. I don't I don't I don't remember the mile mile marker, but they normally have a slip or two if you're running late. And it has good water going in. It's isn't that the one? Isn't that the one right by the bridge? The marina right by the bridge up at the channel there? Uh, I, I don't remember. It's it's. I think it's past the bridge, north of Wrightsville Beach. You know the other bridge. I stayed there. Oh, oh right, right, right. It's just past. Yes, you're right. But I mean, I've stayed there okay, several actually, times, and they do have. You know, they have diesel and occasionally occasionally if you're running late they do have slips just call ahead yeah we yeah. stayed there last night while well, it's uh the diesel was uh 5.99 a gallon uh dockage is 250 a foot but uh it, it is beautiful in there and they uh okay I've, I've never stayed there yeah just a tip i typically when i get down to this area, I would... go ahead Hello? 
Greg, was that somebody trying to say something? We lost him. It's not me. Oh, sorry. Well, I, 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 I don't know if you heard me. I said we stayed there last night. Diesel I was five ninety nine. Yeah. yeah, diesel was five ninety nine a gallon, and it was two fifty a foot. But it was a super nice spot, great docks, and all that stuff. So it's, it was worth it for us last night. That's for sure. So. Good. Good. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, I've never, <clears throat> I've never stayed there, so I don't know what it's like. Um, okay. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, right, Wrightsville Beach to Southport and Cape Fear River. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what you need to do here is you want to use your tide current app when you get to the Cape Fear River. I'm going to flip down one more thing here. It, those of you who are here for the first session, you remember I, I mentioned an app for your phone called My Tide Times Pro. It's a tide chart app. And what it does, it gives you both the tides and the currents. Okay. And you want the current, you want the current application out of this for when you come to places like the Cape Fear River. And I'll come back to that explanation in a minute. But that's the Tide Times Pro. And when you go to the App Store or um, the Android, uh, wherever you get stuff for the Android, um, that is the, um, the, um, the logo that you'll see right there in the, uh, the left, that sort of wave logo. Okay, so <clears throat> using your Tide Current app, you want to enter the Cape Fear River approximately 30 minutes after the ebb has started at the exit to Snow's Cut. Now, that would be the upper midnight channel reference point for your tide and current. So use your, your, your tide app, open it up, scroll through till you get to upper midnight channel, click on that and it'll open up, move it ahead to the, the next day, if indeed, because it'll be the next day you're going through, and then check for the current. And what you want to see is what time the current starts to ebb at okay you want to you want to try and hit it as close to slack water leading into an ebb so that'll pull you down now the nice thing about southport is that it's close enough to wrightsville beach that you've got you can leave almost any time from wrightsville beach up till about one or two o'clock in the afternoon and still get into southport uh before sunset provided you get that current so you've got a, a broad range of time there it's it's not critical the thing you, the reason you want to get that um that slack or that ebb current is because the um, the ebb is two and a half knots. The flood is 1.4 knots, and that'll slow you down significantly. This is um, a, a, a freighter lane. There's lots of big ship traffic, so you want to make sure that you stay close to the channel edges where there's still 25 or 30 feet of water. When you go through Snow's Cut, <clears throat> this is the interesting thing. Snow's Cut, the current is opposite in Snow's Cut from what it will be in the river. So if you've timed it to hit Cape Fear River on the outgoing tide, what's going to happen is snow's cut will be, the current will be against you for that distance, which is half a mile or so. Um, and the reason for that is that the current in snow's cut is uh, predicated on, on the tide state at Carolina Beach Inlet, which you will have just gone past a few minutes previously. Whereas the Cape Fear River is predicated on the, uh, the current in the river or the, uh, the tide in the river. Now, when you get to Southport, you'll find that the restaurants in the harbor will offer you free dockage if you're going in for drinks, you're going in for dinner. There are no services, there's no water, no power. Uh, and the depth is about a five foot maximum. So make sure that you go bow in, especially if you have a power boat. Um, and I've stayed there for a matter of two or three days at a time on occasion. Um, but as long as, like I said, as long as you're having a beer in one of the restaurants or, or going out for lunch or dinner, they're happy to have you there. Okay. Um, moving on. <clears throat> now we come into the section in North Carolina where you have the, the inlets. And these are the problem inlets. Uh, Lockwood's Folly and Charlotte's Inlet have over the years been the two most challenging inlets on the ICW. Um, whoops, hang on a second here. The, for Lockwood's Folly, the key has always been to stay about 50 feet off of the reds running from R46 to R48. And over the years, that advice has always stayed true. If you stay about 50 feet off those, it's not a problem. Now, for Shallots Inlet, it used to be that way, and that's changed in the last couple of years. As you come through Shallots Inlet, you start off in the center. Shallots Inlet is the, um, the, the chart that you see on your right here. As you come through Shallots Inlet, you want to start coming in through the center. And if anything, slightly favoring the green. And as you go through here, favor the green, you come back into deep water as you come around the curve. Then as you go right past the inlet, you get a little bit of, um, of uh, shoal water again, but not too bad. And then you come out of it and you're fine. 
Something to remember about these inlets, you're going to see the depths go from six feet to 18 feet in a heartbeat because of these swirling waters that go through there, create these big, huge um, uh, dips in the, in the bottom. So if your chart, if your, um, if your uh, depth sounder is reading six or seven feet and all of a sudden they're showing 18 feet and then it's back to nine feet, don't think it's your chart plotter or your depth sounder that's wrong when you're going through these inlets. It is actually what is happening underneath your boat, okay? The other thing to remember is make sure that the current at the inlets is not forcing you out of the channel, you know, pulling you in towards the inlet or pushing away depending on which way the, the current's running. Look behind you and see that you're still running on the same track uh, and that you're still in the center of the, uh, the channel, okay? And that's the easiest way to do it. Just look behind you, see where you are in relationship to the last marker you passed, and then look ahead and, and see where you are. And you'll be able to figure it out fairly easily at that point. Okay. Um, now, if you want to avoid the hassle of those two inlets, especially if it's approaching low tide and you have a deep draft like five and a half or six feet, <clears throat> it's easiest to just go offshore. It's a 26 mile run from Southport to Little River Inlet. Um, when you come out of Little River, or when you come out of South, Southport, excuse me, a lot of people run all the way out and follow the big ship inlet out a couple of miles past the shoaling that's out there before they turn south again. I suggest that what you do is you use the, there should be able to see that fairly comfortably. There's what we call a swash channel that comes right off of the, uh, the tip of Bald Island here. And if you look at your charts, it's fairly obvious. It'll run to about as shallow as eight feet. Just come in there carefully, follow your way through, set your markers up and you'll run all the way out. And after about a mile, mile and a half, you'll be back into, into you know, 20, 30 foot water. Uh, but it, it cuts several miles off the trip. So looking at the chart on the left, you can see it's a straight run across till you get to Little River Inlet over here. Little River Inlet is used by the, um, the gambling boats that uh, come out of um, Calabash and, um, and Little River. And they all draft quite a bit. So you've got a nice deep inlet. Um, make sure that you honor the sea boy. Don't try and cut the sea boy thinking that the chart shows you you can do it but you, because you can't. Uh, it shows out quite significantly. Go to the sea boy then just go straight to the, um, to the entrance markers and, and most chart plotters will not show you where the, uh, the marks are in there but they're very obvious as you come through and it's just a matter of following through. There's a nice anchorage right at the intersection of the ICW and by the way, you're now in, in South Carolina but there's a nice anchorage right at the entrance, uh, right at the uh, crossroads of the ICW and the, uh, the river, okay? If you decide to continue on to Myrtle Beach for an anchorage, uh, then you'll hang a left and just follow through. Um, the biggest challenge of that inlet is, is watching out for the small fishing boats, which are, are gonna tend to be everywhere all over the place. Okay, and moving on to our next, oh, no, that was, that was it for now. That was it for now, okay. Uh, the next thing is you're just going to tie up, you're either going to tie up in a little, a little river inlet uh, or you're going to swing all the way down if you've left early down to the Myrtle Beach marinas. And you've got Coquina, you've got, um, oh Lord, there's, there's probably eight or ten different marinas all the way along there. And if you've got lots of time, you could run all the way down into um, as far as Osprey Landing, you know, before the day runs out. So that's it for the moment. Those are the, uh, those are the um, Beaufort to... Um, Myrtle Beach information. Most of it's very easy. The problem areas that you'll find that the shoaling areas uh, are not significantly difficult. Uh, and if you pay attention to, to what I've said here, you'll have no trouble getting by them. Uh, questions, anybody? Hello? Yeah, a question. Um, we're obviously a, a little bit ahead here. Um, the next section going uh, to Osprey Marina, is there any major items we need to be aware of? Where are you now, Ray? Uh, we're on the, the St. James Plantation. So, uh, tomorrow, so tomorrow we'll be at the Myrtle Beach. Um, and then we're going to be down the day after we'll be going to the Osprey Marina. Where did you say you are now? Uh, St. James Marina oh, Plantation. James. Gotcha. There are no difficulties ahead of you. Um, the next section ahead of you is one of the easiest sections of the ICW. Um, uh, if you're coming into Georgetown tomorrow, uh, or if, if no, you won't be coming to Georgetown tomorrow. You'll be stopping two, two days to said. Georgetown. 
What's that? Um, so tomorrow would be the, the to go to the Osprey Marina. Then the following day, which is Saturday, uh, to come into Georgetown. Yeah, um, yeah. You got it's. There's there's no challenges of any sort uh, for the next. Oh Lord. There, there's no challenges for the next several days for you. Uh, there's no difficulties to Osprey from where you're at. Um, yeah, there's no difficulties all the way to Osprey. Um, when you come in from, when you leave Osprey, um, just watch as you're coming down the Waccamaw River that you don't cut any of the corners short. Uh, some of the corners will fall out quite rapidly. Not, uh, but if you pay attention to your chart, you won't have a problem with that. Um, yeah, you've got no uh, no difficulties ahead of you for quite a while now. Hey Ray, we, we just did that trip today. We're at uh, Osprey right now. It's John oh, and Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> so you're at Osprey no, now, John? Yeah, no 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 issues. It was uh, cool. It was a good run today. It's a long day. There's three there's three three swing bridges, but they open on demand, and they were pretty. It was pretty good. It was pretty uh, pretty seamless going through them today. So radio ahead. They're on Channel Nine in South Carolina. There's a good tip for you. Oh, that's good. Instead of 13, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. reminding me. I forgot about that. Yeah. When you get into South Carolina, the VHS Ridge Channel switches to uh, nine. Uh, okay. Great. Uh, good to hear. Thank you. Right. Stacy, you had a question there? I do. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, so we're going to actually be going into Myrtle Beach at about Thanksgiving time. Any good anchorages in case we can't find um, a dock? You're saying you're going into Myrtle Beach at uh, Thanksgiving time? Yeah, any good anchorages? We prefer to stay off the dock, but we will stay in a marina if we need to. But is there any good holding in that area? What should we look for? There is nothing. The, the last anchorage in the Myrtle Beach area will be Little River Inlet. Okay. And then from there, you've got no anchorage until you get into the Waccamaw River, um, actually past osprey marina and then and some the holding in those places is good but oftentimes there's tree branches in that um going down the walk while you then come to um the uh the river and and heading down to georgetown you can anchor yeah. outside of georgetown proper or you can come inside the town inside to the town itself and anchor out here it's a lovely little anchorage they've got several dinghy docks for cruisers but okay. in myrtle beach itself you're not going to find any um, any um, dockage or any anchorage, rather. Pardon me. Hey, okay. Just a, just an FYI, uh, the, the Osprey Marina is a buck a foot, so just if if uh, that's an option for yeah, you. Yeah, Osprey Marina. Okay, I know we have a tentative reservation at Wakawachi, um, just because that was closer for our family is meeting us in Myrtle for Thanksgiving, so that was closer for us. Yeah, walk watch is nice. It's uh, the docks there are no hell. They're um, they're not floating docks, um, but if you can handle the inconvenience of that, it's a it's a nice spot. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you, Tracy. You had a you had a problem. Tracy, you had a question. I see. I sure. I think you might have answered it with St Stacy's. We're doing. Um, we were looking for exactly the opposite. We're looking into going into Myrtle Beach next weekend. We have friends flying into the airport to meet us. So we were looking for if you had any recommendations for a marina that we could stay at that was somewhat between North and South Myrtle Beach or if there were anchorages or anything. So lie down. I think you answered the anchorages, lie but down. I don't know if other than Osprey Landing, you had another suggestion near the airport. Well, the nice thing about, and again, and again this is where the, the waterway guide, waterwayguide.com comes in very handy. It lists all of the marinas along that area, their, their rates and their facilities. Um, but there are, uh, there must be a dozen marinas between Little River Inlet and Georgetown that you could stay at. Um, and there's at least seven or eight or nine uh, right along the Myrtle Beach, along the Strand area. You've got Osprey, um, you've got Coquina, I can't think of it, St. James. Um, so it's just a matter of deciding which one's most convenient for you. But for Thanksgiving weekend, especially, do call ahead and book in advance because it's um, there'll be a lot of people doing what you're doing. 
and you don't want to get caught out, obviously. Perfect. This was so helpful, the whole uh, going through what to expect as we go down the ICW. So thank you so, so much. Well, my, first time, I, I remember, we certainly appreciate it. I remember what it was like my first time. That's why I'm doing this. It's uh, you, you don't know the questions to ask because you don't know what's coming at you. So you're like, what are, what's going to happen next? Honey, I don't know what's going to happen next. What do you think is going to happen next? I don't know, honey. So you're so right. You it sounds like you were on our boat today. So thank you so much for helping us with the next me? stretch. <laughs> Wally, this is Pat Allen. Uh, question for you: When you're transitioning some of those uh, trouble areas, um, do you slow your speed significantly, or just enough to keep leeway? Or, or... Um, if I if I've got the current behind me and I'm blasting along at seven and a half knots, uh, yeah, I slow down a little bit. Um, and the reason for that is that if I do punch into the bottom, I don't want to hit it too hard, but I don't slow down super, super slow. Typically. Um, now that being said, I, I'm, I'm coming up on my 50th trip on the ICW. Um, somebody who's when I'm, I'm, I suspect that when I was less experienced, I probably slowed down a lot more. Um, the thing is get, go to a speed that you're comfortable at, uh, where you've got good control of the boat. And, and, and work with that. Now, if the current's behind you, that's gonna be a little faster. You might wanna slow down a bit more than that. Um, generally, if you're nervous, four or five knots is a safe speed. Um, Cause if you're gonna hit anything, it's only gonna be sand anyway. I know that doesn't sound real encouraging, but you know, sand is a lot better than granite. Right, those right. Us, right. thank you. Those of, us, those of us who learned to sail in the Great Lakes or in the, in the Georgian Bay or up in Maine, we understand granite real well. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Some good questions here today. Hey, Wally. It's uh, Greg McKenzie calling from Toronto. Hi, Greg. Yeah, I'm uh, Mary hey, McKenzie's better half. She's uh, away tonight, so I get to uh, listen in and ask a question. And first of all, I'm we're very envious of everyone who's uh, talking tonight because you're all on your, all on your journey. You're all heading south. You're probably getting warm weather. We're uh, still a ways away we're not gonna be able to leave until august of uh next year and our boat's currently in georgian bay my question wally is uh measuring air draft we've been told our our boat you know depending on who you listen to with the antennas and paraphernalia on the top of the mast is about 63.5 what's the best way you've heard of uh sailboats measuring their air draft so they don't get caught up in any any bridges well, what you do is you climb to the very, very top, ha! and then you balance carefully in the top, and you leap off, and you count 1,000, 2,000. <laughs> okay, I'm joking, Greg. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, what you do is uh, take, take your main halyard and tie um, uh, a measuring tape to it, a, a, a 50 or 60-foot measuring tape, okay. and, just raise the main, and then just raise the main halyard and read what the tape says at the mast. Yes. And then, uh, then add on your height to, from the step down to the water. Mm, okay. Okay. And, and the reason I'm asking, uh, fr friends of ours were, and you're, you'll be able to know where it is, uh, it was called the Wilkerson Bridge. It's a little further north. They um, they had all the Navionics, all Bob 423, like every redundancy possible. And the bridge was, they, they went underneath and they still hit the bridge last week. Uh, Wilkerson, so yeah, I don't know if you know that one. It's a little further up north the ICW. Say again. Yeah, it's a, it's at the bottom of the it's the alligator bottom of the alligator Pongo Canal. Okay. The trick and to now, that one is real, real simple. Okay. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say okay. you go ahead. While the trick to that one is real, real simple. There's no. I've got a bad internet connection. That's why we're we're crossing uh, crossing comments here. The uh, Wilkerson Bridge is at the bottom of the alligator Pongo Canal. Uh, it is, um, there's no tide in that area. So any change in the water depth is based on the wind direction. And, uh, and offhand, I cannot remember which, which direction piles the, the water deeper and which makes it uh, less steep. Mm. But what you want to do there is when you know you're coming to that area, contact the Osprey, uh, sorry, Dowry Creek Marina, D-O-W-R-Y, Dowry Creek Marina. Okay. And Steve or, Steve or Cindy or Jeff will answer the phone. And they have a, a, a tide chart, a, 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 a chart at their, um, at the water there. And they can just look at that and they, it's, it's, it's um, corroborated, correlated, correlated. 
it's correlated with the uh, the bridge heights. So they'll be able to tell you what the clearance of the bridge is based on what they have at their marina, which is only a mile and a half, two miles away. So you can do that, and that would be your best bet. Now, now the trick to that, Greg, just you know, at 63 and a half, um, you're, you should be good on all the bridges without a problem. Um, Wilkerson uh, usually creates a problem for boats that are 64 and a quarter or anything more than that. Um, Greg and Pat, you probably remember Nate having trouble. The, maybe he wasn't with us last year when we did this. I can't remember. But uh, out, of the, out of the 100 plus boats that I brought south, his was the only one that we had to fill the dinghy with water and heal him over so that we could get him under the bridge. <laughs> um, so again, um, just make that's, sure that- uh, That's if great advice, if great anything, advice. If you're anything over 63 feet, I just gave somebody that advice last night. They, they took it, they got under without a problem. Um, but um, if you're anything over 63 feet, take your um, jewelry at the top of the mast and just remove it. And then take your VHF antenna and turn it upside down. So that it's pointing downwards. It's okay. not going to affect your, uh, your VHF reception so badly that it creates a problem. But what it'll do is it'll, it'll get the VHF antenna underneath the top of the mast. And that means you're not gonna be smacking the, uh, the antenna against the bridge if you're too tall. Interesting. And just from your experience, do you know of people who literally based on you know, the bridges that are coming up or on the day, they'll send somebody up the mast to just take down you know, the hardware for a day or two? I didn't catch all of that. Could you repeat, please? Is that common practice for sailboats with tall masts to take off, you know, the hardware at the top for a day or two yes. based on the bridges? Yeah, I usually I usually tell anybody who's at about 63 and a half or more to remove the jewelry from the top of their uh, their mast. Um, you know, it's going to cost you a couple bucks to to have a rigger do it if you don't do it yourself, but uh, that's still cheaper than having to replace those parts down the road. That's great advice, Wally. Thank you very much. Thank Remember you. too, that when you get further south, the uh, the mast height is not so important because um, in the north, you have much less tide. For example, on the alligator pungo, you have no tide. Um, but once you get down south into uh, North and South Carolina and into Georgia, uh, you've got anywhere up to eight or nine feet of tide. So if you've got a, a mast height problem, you just wait till the tide goes down and slide under then. The only, um, the only time that doesn't work is if you're immediately following a hurricane or you've had some really heavy rainy weather um, or you have um, a king tide from a full moon or something like that. And then you might have higher than normal tides or higher than normal tides that'll create a problem. But again, these are specific circumstances and you'll be aware of them as you come south. So, um, Can I make one comment here, Wally? This is Pat, sure, one comment. That when, you, when you're approaching one of those inlets that are so close to the ocean, you, you can slow down is fine, but you wanna make sure that you have steerage way because some oh, of those oh, little oh, swirls oh, coming across the inlet will, will have no issue pushing you out of the way if you can't power up and steer out of it. That's a good point. Um, and that would be directed to the person who asked about what speed you should be doing. Make sure that right. you always got enough speed that you do have steerage. Uh, but the car's not overtaking. You have to tell you making... that's always to keep steerage. Pardon? Fuck. You're breaking up there. Hello? Um... Uh, whoever that is, I can't. I, I'm afraid I can't make up what you're um, what you're saying. Hello, hello. Oh, can anybody hear me? Have, have we lost contact? No, I can we hear got you, Wally. Wally. We got you. Yeah, Ray and Debbie are here. We can hear you fine. I can hear you. We can hear you. No, at my end, sometimes it goes completely silent, but I've, as I said, I've got a sketchy connection. I'm using a hotspot and I'm going to have to talk to T-Mobile about why it's not working right. <laughs> hey, did, uh, did we have any other questions? Uh, for those of you who came in late, um, we're just about done, but I did record this session and this session will be available online in about, uh, in about an hour or so after I've had supper. So, so 
just go on to sailing and cruising and you'll see the link for the, uh, the recording. Yeah, so uh, Ray, Ray and Debbie here. We have a, a question. Uh, somebody mentioned that they're uh, a couple days ahead of us at the Osprey Marina. Would, would you guys be willing to uh, provide us information of how your day went, where we could trade like cell numbers or emails? This is our first time yep. down the IW. So. Yep, we're, that's John and Cheryl. We're, we're sitting in Osprey Marina right now. And our, my cell number is 416. 416-254-7522. Hey, could you repeat the last four digits again? 7522. 7522. Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll contact you and we, we greatly appreciate uh, any information yeah. you give us. Uh, sure. Thank you. You're going to love this place. It's, it's great in here. You, you, you just have to be careful not to miss the entrance. <laughs> It's always the challenge sometimes with some of these marinas, yeah. making sure you yeah. find your way in. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> and and we'll, we'll give you a call as soon as uh, we're done here. Yeah, we can, sure. then you'll Sounds have good. our contact information too. That's great. great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Any other questions? Is that it for today? Great. Hey, thanks, Wally. My pleasure. Thanks, Wally. Um, thanks, Wally. Very helpful. Thanks, Wally. Have a good week. Right. Thanks, Wally. Next week, I'll be doing, next week, I'll be doing Myrtle Beach to um, to uh, uh, probably past Charleston, maybe into Georgia. So Excellent. have a good week, everybody. If you have any questions or concerns, just get a hold of me on Messenger, and I'll uh, I'll try and answer your questions for you as I see them. Okay, great. I'm always available. Thank you very much, Wally. Thanks, this is Wally. great. Thank, Thank you, Wally. Thank you. Thank you, Wally. Good night. All right. Bye bye. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Be safe. Huh.